afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for joining us for this very special webinar today, where we are going to reflect on inclusive history of science communication, what it means, looking backward, looking forward, what we can learn from it, how we can enrich our work as science communication practitioners and researchers. Now, I think we all know, and, and it's been discussed quite extensively in the literature as well, that science communication can be enriched by including diverse perspectives and cultures and con countries and contexts. And exactly the same is true for history. There are so many fascinating stories, diverse histories that brought us together where we are today. And that is why it was really a special opportunity and a privilege and a pleasure for me to be involved in, in a small way in this Lifeology flashcard course, looking at an inclusive history of science communication. Now, what we're going to do today is, first of all, I've invited Pei Jara, who's one of the driving forces behind Lifeology and these flashcard courses, to just tell us what these courses are all about, how they put together, how they come to life, how people can get involved. And then we've got three very special people also lined up to talk about the specific topic today, inclusive history of science communication. We've got a, the author of the course, we've got the illustrator of the course, and we've got an historian of science who was also one of the reviewers of the course. So throughout, I, I'm, I'm sure by now you know how it works. We welcome you to ask questions using the chat function um, on this meeting. Um, we, we have planned it in such a way that there should be ample time for discussion afterwards. So when you think of something, when you agree, when you disagree, when you've got another example that we should think about, please let us know. And um, I look forward to having that discussion. So we're going to kick off uh, with Paige, first of all. Now, Paige has got that lovely title that I really like, calling herself a scientist turned storyteller, really passionate about novel and innovative ways of sharing science and telling science stories. And she's the co-founder of Lifeology, based in the USA. We look forward to hearing from you, Paige. Thank you. Um, so Lifeology, I, I'm the VP of Science Communication here at Lifeomic, um, where I'm the co-founder of Lifeology. I just want to stop real quick. Can everyone hear me? Okay, like thumbs up. Um, my connection says it's a little unstable, so. Yes, we can hear you, we can okay. hear you. Okay, great. So um, here at Lifeology, it's, it's an interesting, it's been a very interesting project over the last few years to kind of merge a technology-based uh, kind of innovation for science communication, as well as a methodology too. So I'll chat about how Lifeology really is kind of the merging of, of mobile friendly technology and art with um, a method that, that is, uh, revolves around collaboration. So just to present a little bit about Lifeology, we'll soon share if you haven't already seen the Lifeology course um, that we'll be talking about today, which is on the an inclusive history of science communication. We'll share it in the chat. Um, but if you look through it, you'll see the technology is, you know, it, it's supposed to be a mobile friendly format for people to kind of swipe through and get a bite sized um, introduction to a topic. So to learn in a very accessible way, if they're scared of science or they have low literacy or in this case, just to have fun to look at um, interesting visuals and to kind of dive deeper into a topic in a new way. Um, this was the idea for Lifeology, um, the, both the format, but also the idea of combining art with bite-sized text. So it was all, it, from the beginning, it was about mobile-friendly bite-sized education to make science and health information more accessible to people. Um, but from the start where I co-founded Lifeology with um, our VP of design here at Lifeomic, um, we kind of immediately saw a bigger picture that in order to create these lifeology courses, you really needed collaboration. Like ideally it was scientists working with artists uh, to make this happen. So lifeology, we kind of founded the whole thing on collaboration, that a good course is the collaboration between an, a scientist, an artist, a storyteller, um, and ideally uh, diverse individuals um, within those populations in order to bring diverse perspectives into the course and create better science communication. Um, so I've learned a lot about working with artists over the course of working um, at Lifeology and creating Lifeology courses. And it's always amazing to see, like, 
if you know, when you start having ideas, um, communicating science, how an artist sees it differently and what they can bring to the table um, that really helps speak to broader audiences. So because of that, also at Lifeology, we've tried to have very hard to start building a diverse community. So we have a Slack channel and uh, a web, WordPress site where people can sign up and be part of the Lifeology community and more soon on the community side where people can uh, kind of contact each other and collaborate. Um, and we've worked very hard to recruit diverse individuals into that community so that um, we, we have, uh, you know, minority artists and storytellers that we can pull, especially if we're creating courses that are meant for specific populations that, you know, ideally we're pulling st storytellers and artists from those populations in order to best speak to those audiences. Um, so those are just some of the things to keep in mind as you're looking through our course, like these are the things that go into making a good life course, and it really is about um, diversifying collaboration of science communication. And that's it for me. Thank you very, very much, um, Paige, for that introduction. Um, for me, certainly having invo been involved in the Lifeology course, uh, writing more than one course with you by now and with others, I can certainly attest to that is um, really a creative and also a challenging experience. Um, I should say, first of all, I was so excited about today's topic that I completely forgot to introduce myself. Apologize for that. My name is uh, Marina Yubar. I'm a science communication researcher, but also a practitioner in South Africa. I'm working at Stellenbosch University. So I mentioned that, um, you know, I've worked also with Paige on, on one or more of these courses. And it made me think of something that I read by a local science journalist who said, just when, if something is easy to read, it doesn't mean it was easy to write. And I think one can apply that to these courses and similarly also say if something is quick to read, if something is short and concise, it doesn't mean it was quick to create. It actually takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of versions and, and hashing and thrashing it out to arrive at these short, concise, clear um, texts that accompany the, the beautiful illustrations that have become the sort of the trademark for me of these lifeology flashboard courses. So I've asked uh, Paige to share with you the link in the chat where you can find out more, uh, where you can simply find more of these courses and, and just enjoy exploring them and, and looking at the topics that you may be interested in. But today now we are focusing on this topic that you know, was, was illustrated via one of these courses. And the topic today is an inclusive history of science communication. And we're going to move on next to Siddharth Kankaria. He is also based in India. He's going to talk to us a little bit about his views on why we needed such a course, why we need a diverse perspective on science communication history. Why do we need to talk about inclusivity and diversity and decolonialization of science and, and how it all happened for him um, through this course? Thank you, Siddharth. Um. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, we hear you. Great. All right. So uh, hello and good day to everyone. Uh, I'm Siddharth and I am a science communication practitioner and researcher from India. Uh, today, what I'm going to be talking about is a brief overview of the Lifeology course that me and Agya created together. But I will also talk about the motivation behind creating this course and why it is important to engage with perspectives and viewpoints and uh, from the global south especially especially marginalized communities right <clears throat> uh, sorry about that yes uh, right so when we think about the history of science communication one of the sort of key narratives which is used in in sort of understanding and teaching the history of science communication is the is the narrative of scientific controversies like the mad cow disease uh, the rise of gm crops or the rise of nanotechnology as a field so often these scientific controversies are framed as as being very important catalyzing factors which has forced the rethinking of audiences approaches and how we teach science communication and while these narratives of scientific controversies sort of uh, catalyzing the, the the rethinking of different science communication models like the deficit dialogue and participation models that we're all familiar with. Now, this narrative of using scientific controversies has has been because there is a lot of truth in it, and a lot of these science communication models have benefited from reflecting on their own practice and research because of these controversies. Uh, this narrative of using scientific controversies as a cause effect uh, for the development of science communication models is something that is ubiquitously used across 
the globe for teaching research and practice of science communication and while this narrative is an extended narrative for teaching science communication uh, it does beg the question whether these sort of approaches of what encompasses uh, the dialogue or the participation model of science communication were these things which were only developed as a result of these scientific controversies or were they actually pre-existing in different cultures times continents uh, much before that and that's something that i wanted to sort of question with these uh, with by by question this narrative now a way of questioning this narrative of of scientific controversies pushing the field of science communication forward is to sort of look at the current biases that we might have now let me let me give you my own example i i was a student in the uk of science communication i was trained formally in science communication and i have been a practitioner in india for the last 6 years and i've come across my fair share of science communication resources teaching materials courses workshops and and so on and so forth now one thing that i've always noticed is that most of these science communication case studies examples approaches actors formats you name it are mostly focused on a very uh, on contexts which are very heavily reliant on europe and north america they are mostly predominantly in english uh they also use contexts which are predominantly cisgendered or heteronormative and these are some of the biases that i think we all can agree that exist in sort of the teaching uh, curriculum resources in science communication now when page approached me for writing a course on the history of science communication i thought it was an excellent opportunity to sort of question uh, this sort of what we understand by the history of science communication and sort of expand the notion of what is the history of science communication by using some examples from the global south uh now i would like to make the case that culture that science communication uh, has been happening for many 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 thousands of years and cultures from across the globe have been engaging in ways of producing knowledge as well as sharing them by using a rich diversity of approaches formats actors uh, like folk traditions and um, indigenous practices and so on and so forth now i thought this was a great opportunity to sort of question and expand the history of science communication by doing this and there is a lot of benefit in looking at examples from the global south for example many of these indigenous practices and of knowledge sharing and production from the global south often focus on community building they have inherently uh, approaches which are dialogic and participatory they also make use of creative approaches like folk art and tradition and cultures uh, and they really blend it really well together with scientific rationality and thinking so there is a lot of benefits of engaging with, with these global south examples and today i'll talk about three short examples to sort of take us on a journey uh, of how we can learn from these global south examples now let us go back to 10 to 20000 years ago in what is now in the in the nation in the first nations which is now known as australia now a lot of the aboriginal communities in australia back then used to have a very rich tradition of oral storytelling now these communities engaged in oral storytelling practices uh, by which they communicated information or knowledge about geology astronomy tool making agriculture natural disasters and so on and so forth now something which is very interesting about these uh, oral storytelling practices from the aboriginal australia was that they what they understood as knowledge was much 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 more broader than what we understand as science it included technical knowledge it included uh, skill based knowledge it, and most importantly it included lived experiences now a benefit of having a, a more broader definition of knowledge was that um, these practices these oral story during practices often uh, did not differentiate between uh, disciplinary silos but more importantly they did not differentiate between creation and sharing of knowledge so the creation or the production of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge were pretty much intertwined with each other and they were very very heavily dependent on people's lived experiences and their surroundings and because of these factors these knowledge systems were much more easier to communicate but also understand and engage with so there is something about embracing lived experiences that we can note on this example now let us come back to a little bit more contemporary times uh, in the 2000s uh, we all know there was an ebola crisis and uh, western uh, south africa has uh, western africa has a tradition of using griots who are basically storytellers historians nomadic um, historians who travel around different communities and villages and communicate information about science religion politics and so on and so forth now during the ebola crisis a lot of health communication organizations uh, recruited these griots to sort of communicate health communication uh, outputs to the local communities and and tribes uh, by using a rich tradition of local context of local languages music and dance and storytelling and and this led to a very harmonious way of combining western scientific thinking and rationality with indigenous practices local context and traditional uh, folk art and forms 
right? So this is uh, this is another learning that we can take by incorporating indigenous context in terms of making our messaging and science communication much more uh, locally, uh, much more relevant to the local context. Another example that we can look at is the example of people science movement in, in the 1960s in India. Now, people science movement in the 1960s in India were basically started by a group of scientists uh, social reformers and activists who traveled around different villages of India and they communicated information about health, sanitation, hygiene, uh, all of those things which were important to people in the villages. But more importantly, they also engaged in a lot of um, what we what is now called as science for social reform, right? So these activists and scientists basically traveled around and they used the, the framing or the context of rapid industrialization, which was displacing communities in the Indian villages. And they used that framing to sort of engage people with scientific thoughts by saying that science was not just meant for the rich elites who were trying to industrialize the country, but also meant for the, the local part, uh, the peasants in the village who could use science to sort of improve their lives and also to question this hegemony of, of the elites in terms of urbanizing India. So again, in this example, we see that by using more community-centric approaches to engaging people and using context that really affected people's livelihoods, uh, people were able to really engage people with a lot of scientific information. And I should say more of knowledge production and sharing rather than scientific, just to be more broad. Right. So these are just three examples and there are many, many more that we can talk about. But for today, I'll just stick to these three. And from these examples, we can see that there is a very rich diversity of people, practices, perspectives across the world that we can learn from. Right. Uh, there are examples which are much more long term and cross cultural than, than what we learn in science communication courses across the country. Uh, in addition to embracing these diverse uh, perspectives and viewpoints uh, and views, it's also important to sort of think about questioning the power and gaze that is inherent within Western scientific institutions, uh, practices and context while we're engaging with a more global history of science communication, right? And this is something we can talk about later during our presentation. Uh, and more importantly, in, in order to sort of embrace a more diverse uh, history of science communication of people, of practices, of perspectives, it's very important to sort of include and empower different viewpoints and voices and perspectives of different people so that they can sort of take a stake in, in what's happening rather than just being uh, passive participants. Right. So to, to move towards a more sort of global understanding of science communication, it is very important to understand the history of science communication, which is why I think it's very important to have a more globalized, a more multicultural, more diverse uh, understanding of the history of science communication. Uh, and we have seen from some of the examples that I've shared today that there's a rich diversity of approaches, of actors, of examples, of case studies, of science communication from across the world, which is not just restricted to, you know, Western Eurocentric, Anglophone or heteronormative context. And, and, and by broadening these perspectives and examples and case studies in the practice, research and teaching of science communication, we can really move towards a more global understanding of science communication. Uh, while we do this, it's very important to sort of prioritize listening, active uh, community building, enabling a sense of agency in the kinds of people we are trying to engage. But it's also important to foreground non-Western ways of seeing, knowing, doing, and enabling, and exchanging of knowledge, and encouraging more socially and culturally embedded ways of knowing and understanding the world. Now, our Lifeology course was a very, very, very small attempt to move in this direction, but we really hope that all of us, all of you will engage with us in, in, in a conversation and sort of make small changes in the practice research and teaching of science communication so that collectively we can move towards a more global history of science communication. Uh, with that, I'll rest my case. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very, very much for that whirlwind overview. And I, I like the fact that you say it's a process, it's a start, it's we definitely, there's much more that can be done, many more histories that can be included and can be written up. I know we talked about it um, before, how hard it was for you to select, you know, what to include, what not to include. I just want to mention something in case there's any confusion. The illustrations that Siddharth showed now uh, indeed comes from this come from this course, but the text, um, you know, it was just for his presentation for today. When you actually engage with the course, you're going to find a different text where those uh, beautiful illustrations go alongside, you know, actually some a storyline. So to experience that, you're going to have to go to the link that page provided. So next then, our, our next guest is going to talk to us about these illustrations, how, how difficult it is to bring the story to life, because indeed the text and the illustrations together 
That's the success story for me of this approach. Now, Arga Mana is an illustrator, a cartoonist, but also amateur science historian. He's also based in India. He loves illustrating science stories through comics and cartoons. And um, I would love to hear from you a little bit, um, Arga, about the process that you were involved with here, because we so often hear about art and science linkages and using art in science communication, but it's not always where we have such a tangible experience to discuss, because I, I could just imagine, you know, coming up with 35 to 40 different illustrations that each one uniquely is relevant to the text. It, mm -hmm. it can't be that easy. So we look forward to hearing from you, Arga. Um, is Arga there? Are you there, Arga? Just want to make sure that I know some. There could be some internet challenges somewhere. I think we've lost him, Marina. Okay. Well, if Arga is not with us, um, he's the illustrator on this course. That, that done those beautiful artworks. Then I'm going to suggest that we go next to um, Professor Bruce Lowenstein. Bruce, I know you're you're ready to stand in if necessary. Um, Bruce is a historian of science, somebody that I've had the privilege to work with over, over many years. He's a professor of science communication based at um, Cornell University in the United States. He was one of the uh, reviewers on this course, and I know it's a topic that interests him very much. So shall we hand over to Bruce? Uh, so I think Arga just was able to get back into the meeting. Arga, if you, before, before I jump in, let me see if Arga was able to join in. Not yet. Okay, so I will go ahead and talk and then we'll have um, uh, Arga, Arga will fill in afterwards. It, um, thank you very much for the invitation to be uh, part of this discussion today. Uh, as, uh, as Marina said earlier, I was one of the reviewers, so I had nothing to do with producing the, 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 the Lifeology course, but I did get to read it before many of you did. Um, and, and it's really just a wonderful way of, of looking at science. And it raises for me a question about whether I'm actually the right person even to be commenting. Um, I am, uh, as, as Siddharth said, this isn't just about bringing in perspectives from the global south, but it's about all kinds of diversity. Uh, and here I am, I'm an older, white, cisgender male teaching at an elite uh, American research university. It's not clear to me that my perspective is the one we need to hear, because in fact, the whole point of this course is to say, what are the things that the people like me missed? Um, because we did miss it. Certainly when I started uh, working on the history of public communication of science and technology, which is now almost 40 years ago, uh, what we were looking at was the history of, I mean, my home dissertation was science communication in the United States after World War II. It's literally the title of it. Uh, and uh, that, you know, that's missing a whole lot. But even the people who were being slightly broader in their understanding were looking largely at France or at, uh, or at Germany and uh, Northern, Northern Europe, not even Southern Europe. So there's absolutely been a need to, to see what we missed and what that perspective that we brought was missing. We were missing, we were doing it in English so even the people who were looking at Germany were still talking about science in the English sense. And I remember once getting a, a, an article that was about history from a German scholar, actually Marina's colleague, Peter Weingart. Uh, and uh, I asked him, why are you submitting this article on, on history to a public understanding of science journal, which at the time I was editing. And he said, no, the problem, Bruce, is you're thinking in English where you say science, if you think in German, where you say Wissenschaft, knowledge, which is the term that Siddharth was using earlier, all immediately we start thinking broadly. So we also have this issue of language that comes in that we have to be thinking about the different ways uh, these give us different understandings. Uh, we have to be thinking about um, how, 
what, that in fact there has been there have been studies in other places. Uh, there are articles on the history of science communication in Mexico, in Brazil, in Japan, in China, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, one of our colleagues in the early days of this uh, uh, of the public communication of science and technology network uh, has has published a, a book on. Uh, 5,000 years of science communication in, in China. So we, there is stuff out there, but we haven't brought it into the center of our, of our discussions. And that's really what we need to be doing. And when we do that, what we start seeing is that we not only have to rethink what we mean by science communication, but we have to rethink what we mean by science. Uh, and, and again, Siddharth commented on this uh, a lot, that we have to be thinking not just about the technical science knowledge, but about the social context in which that knowledge was created and communicated. So one of the challenges is that for many people who are new to science communication, especially if they've come from the science community, as so many of our colleagues have, including many of us, what we're, we're excited by science, we're excited by this new knowledge and we want to uh, find ways to convey that excitement and the, and, the, and the technical knowledge. Or sometimes we talk about wanting to talk about the process of science, but then we usually mean the sort of start and stopping experimental hypothesis, observational sense of process. When really what this kind of course with this kind of different look at the history of science communication tells us is that we need to be thinking about the real process of science, the messy process of science, the way in which people have gone out and been curious about nature and used whatever tools they had available uh, in their context to make sense of the world. And they've used whatever tools of communication they had available, storytelling or visuals or um, markings of various kinds to, to share that knowledge. And they've done it in different kinds of institutional contexts, in some cases without institutions, in other cases creating new institutions like the people science movement that Siddharth mentioned. And so as we think about what looking at this diversity of the history of science communication does, is it forces us to think about science as a body of knowledge, science as a very messy social process, and science as a set of social institutions. And when we start thinking about science that way, first off, it changes our understanding of what science is, but it also changes our sense of what we need to communicate about or with our, with our communities as we are in, engaging with them. We need to understand, for example, the relationship of different communities to their institutions. Uh, and why there's trust in some institutions and not in other institutions. And that's as much a part of science communication as, um, as explaining, let's say, how a vaccine works, just to pick an example at random. Um, so that, that's my first major point, is thinking about science in this much broader way. I think a course like this forces us to do that. The second thing that this course does, and I hinted at this at the beginning, is force us to rethink what we even mean by the history of science communication. About four or five years ago, uh, Luis Masterani and uh, Ideo uh, Morena and, and I uh, edited a small collection of articles on the history of science communication in the journal JCOM. And later on, I'll put a link to that in the, in the chat. And shortly after we published it, we got a fairly sharp critique from a traditional historian of science, pointing out that we had missed, that we had talked about the history of science communication as though it began in 1945, after World War II, more or less, not exactly, but more or less. And that we had missed a huge amount of work in the traditional history of science that also dealt with science communication. Uh, and, and this is, I think, a challenge for us, is how do we think about this field of science communication? We, in the, the 
the large book on communicating science in a global context that we that the PCST network uh, recently published with uh, edited and uh, the lead editor was Toss Gascoigne, who I know is on the call here. Uh, it's a wonderful collection. All of us, many of us are still working our way through it, even those of us who are on the editorial board. Uh, and yet it is largely about recent science communication. And so how do we push back? How do we understand that just as there's a history of science that goes back hundreds and thousands of years, how do we understand that science communication has? And this is a challenge for us as we define what are the boundaries of our field and, and uh, where do we look? Uh, the value of visuals, another, another element uh, and of short storytelling, this sort of compact vision of how lifeology work is really my third point. So it happens yesterday in my own course on public engagement with science. We were reading uh, Emily Dawson and Sophie, Sophia Wang's short zine version of Emily's book on equity, exclusion, and everyday science learning. And the discussion that my students had was largely about how much easier it is, even for them as graduate students studying science communication, for them to get the main message when they read it in a short illustrated version. And you know, those of us who are academics, we love producing our, our jargon filled, uh, technically detailed work, but maybe that's not the best way for us to be presenting our work. How do we think about the complications of language? I think I saw uh, Sibu Bayela also uh, uh, on the uh, participant list and we were looking at some of his work about talking in different languages and trying to understand that it's not just about translating from English into mm -hmm. other languages, but it's actually about understanding nature in the context and using the language and using the concepts from within that culture to explain something that might be a modern scientific finding, but is nonetheless um, something that needs to be built on the on the local culture. Those are some of my sort of initial observations um, on this. Again, it's just an amazingly rich uh, uh, project and I'm really glad to have been part of it. And I hope that uh, Arga has been able to stay with us and that we can now hear a bit more about the visuals. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Bruce. And I'm, I'm glad that you specifically highlighted that the value of visuals um, as one of the key points that you responded to, because that's indeed, um, Arga, what we would like you to talk about, you know, the challenge of coming up with a series of visuals that sort of bring the whole story to life and, and just tell us a little bit about that process. Over to you, Arga. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Um, but, uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Arga Manna. I'm a science cartoonist and an amateur science historian from India. So, uh, Bruce uh, beautifully told about the value of the visuals in science communication and the history of science communication. And he mentioned that uh, the academicians uh, most of the time use uh, words like jargons to, of course, they have to write papers and, um, and publish since they are academicians. And visual can ease this process and uh, can make the subject more communicable to the students and uh, in the public domain. Uh, but uh, I think there are another role of visuals, like it's just mm, not the process of easing the whole subject or making it more communicable. Rather, uh, visual have an, another kind of impact on human brain. Like uh, suppose uh, just yesterday I came through an article, I just uh, forgot uh, in which uh, media it got published uh, part of New York Times. Like, what is the role of the visuals still uh, from the area, from the work on June? Okay, so like uh, in um, uh, since the post World War, in many areas of the world is involved in war and human conflict, humanitarian crisis, and the photographers uh, plays an important role because, of course, if you, if I ask any one of you about the famine crisis or the hunger crisis in Ethiopia or somewhere else in Africa, uh, there are certain visuals will come into your mind, like the Pulitzer winning uh, photographer's visuals, the child is uh, eating and the vulture is waiting for him. 
So that's a very powerful media. Visual is a very powerful media, right? So the another role to make a visual collective is to create a, like archive, so that people uh, not only for uh, not only uh, for the purpose of making it easier, so that they can understand, rather so so that it can uh, hit them hard, or uh, so that they can memorize. So, and memorize that thing. Okay, there was another culture. Okay, there was someone else has tried before, or parallel, or in collaborative nature with the Europeans or the Americans uh, in the realm of uh, making science or history of science or communicating science. So the, our course in for lifeology, uh, it was the heart of our course, like bringing all different kind of cultures, like as Siddharth showed you the beautiful slides on one me, and uh, like. Cultures from Aboriginal as Australian, and the Dryad culture, the storytelling through songs uh, in Africa, and also uh, since uh, Paige already have pasted the link in the chat box, you can see uh, 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 if you go to the course that I have used visuals from the science, people science movement happened in Kerala in late 60s and 70s in India actually, but she just mentioned that in late 60s and late 70s. In India, there are certain science movements, and I tried to use that those visuals uh, in the course. But even before that, in Bengal, in uh, late colonial phase of India, Ashok Chandranath Bosch, uh, you all you must have known his name. Uh, the boson particle came after his name. Ashok uh, Chandranath Bosch also tried certain movement. So the challenges I faced uh, for particular this course uh, is this is. A very much layered course. Uh, that wrote it beautifully. Uh, page edited it beautifully. There are tension between layers, like uh, time and space is one layer. Science and history, of course, the science, the outcome of the science, the scientific results came out from directly from the laboratory, and the history, the conflict and the tension with science and history, of course, another layer. And text and the image, of course, the course is about uh, entanglement between text and image. So, the another. Uh, Layer I would like to mention was itself in the images, metaphors versus reality. Okay, you know that in science or in history, uh, it's a marriage between something information which is very crude, which is very objective, and another kind of information or I would say it's concept which is subjective or in abstract. Okay, it's easier to write these things, but how to visualize them? So to visualize, to making, to bring them into life or in visual, you have to use metaphor. But I was very certain from the beginning that if I want to draw this, I, if I want to draw this whole course, it will be a complete balance between some metaphoric image. You can find in the course that I have I used some metaphoric image when I tried to narrate the the conflicts or the uh, controversies, scientific controversies came out from a crisis. Okay, and the models, but. Parallelly, I tried to narrate them uh, through uh, the, some newspaper cuttings and the uh, uh, illustrations made uh, by uh, made by the illustrators in the past. So I I was certain that uh, while redrawing those newspaper cuttings uh, in the course, uh, you will find many newspaper cuttings and many uh, artworks done by British masters. I have uh, I have redrawn them. It's not uh, um, uh, copy pasted from internet. It's, uh, I have drawn them again. So uh, anyway, so uh, the idea was I um, uh, I wanted to be very accurate while mentioning uh, these kind of visual uh, examples. Then when I tried to Arka? Uh, narrate Arka? the sub yeah yeah. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. I just want you to see if you can wrap up. I really want to make sure we have time for questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up within 30 seconds. Okay, I'm just okay. at the end of my talk. Yeah, so um, uh, while uh, narrating the concept of the subject, theme, I use the metaphors. So the challenge was like that, so to intermingle all those layers into a single space. So then I did some research, and with the help of Siddharth and Paige, uh, I illustrated the whole course. Yeah, that's it for me. Okay. Well, I would like to congratulate you once again on your work in bringing this uh, course to life with those beautiful illustrations. I know I told you during the process that I almost felt like I was walking.
looking through an art gallery as I was looking through the illustrations. They're really, really special. So yeah, there's been a number of questions and I want to put this one open to anybody on the panel who would like to respond. And um, one of our members, Dr. A.P. Jairaman asked, um, is it true that science communication maybe historically started out as an anti-superstition activity and that this still continues? Um, he uses the example of India, but maybe also in other countries. If I had to say from, from an African perspective, as far as I know, it certainly may have been one of the motivators, but certainly not the only or maybe the main motivator uh, you know, to counteract uh, superstition. But I would love to hear any other views on that. Sure. So I would say that that's, if we define science communication in the modern way, that is what we do now, yes, it's much of it was anti-superstition, but if we understand science communication in an earlier context as being about trying to understand nature and trying to explain, trying to see the patterns in nature and trying to uh, both record and communicate those to other people, some of the kinds of things that the traditional griots did or that the um, people in the land we call Australia now did, then I think that's not about superstition. That's about trying to see patterns in, in, in nature. Okay. Um, and then the issue of language always comes up. I mean, some of you also referred to it. Um, here we are today, once again, having a webinar in English because we do have to find a common language. Of course, the visuals, become a language um, in, in their, on their own as well. But there's been a few questions about how do we, how do you feel in terms of making science communication history more inclusive, more, more diverse? You know, how can we, you know, how, how can we overcome this barrier of, of language that excludes, still excludes many people? It's not an easy one, but maybe just some thoughts. Siddharth, so, you have a view on that, maybe? Yes, so I'd just like to add that uh, in my experience of working in India, whenever we are trying to communicate uh, science in regional languages, there's always this issue of two-step translation, right? So you have to sort of translate uh, the science, which is predominantly the first form of, of the information is in English. So you have to translate it from English to that regional language, but you also have to translate the science into more accessible forms, right? So when you're trying to translate science, into more accessible form, which is basically what science communication is. But then you have an added layer of translating the language. A lot of the metaphors and analogies, which is a very important part of how you communicate science, gets jumbled up and lost in, in that process, right? So there's a lot of uh, attenuation in that two-step translation process. And what happens is that um, the message is actually lost. The context is lost. The, the beauty of, of what might be a very beautiful piece of science communication in English completely gets lost when you're translating it. And so the, this, the only solution that I see in this way is to create these resources in the language itself, in the regional vernacular language itself, where people from the local context who are embedded within the community, are, who are aware of the context and the, and the metaphors in the community, use those and create that content for science communication de novo by themselves. And that's the only way we can have science communication that is that touches people's lives and hearts and, 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 and is accessible to them, right? And the other, other side of the coin is that if you have, if you're forcing people to sort of learn about science in, in the lingua franca, which is English, a lot of times they're not able to catch up. There's a lot of difficulties, that barriers that they might face in terms of understanding because they're being forced to think about not just a new world, which is science and, and the rigor of science, but also they have to deal with the, with the problem of language, right? And that really, really limits their capacity to sort of engage and participate. And that in some ways uh, is, is a big barrier for them. So that's just two things that I think uh, I have seen in my experience. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think those are valuable uh, perspectives. And I think it, it adds to some of the discussion going on in the chat about, you know, how do we get uh, to more diverse histories, to more, to more you know, examples that date further back. Uh, Bruce spoke about the challenge of, you know, going, going back much further than the middle of the last century, maybe even going back several centuries. And something that I experienced personally when I looked at this uh, flashcard course for the first time, I think it's just human for all of us to look for something that relates to your own country, to your own culture, to your own experience. And I was so happy to see the African examples in there. I would have, 
I would have complained, you know, if, if Africa it wasn't represented, just because I, I always look for that. And I think it's the same is true for all of us, depending on, on where you come from. And so with that in mind, I want to ask um, maybe Paige, if you have any views on, you know, we use the terms diversity, inclusivity and equity a lot in science communication these days. Um, but I'm, I'm also worried sometimes it may become a bit of a buzzword. And, and what does it really mean maybe to you if we say in a history of science communication versus an inclusive history of science communication? Maybe if just focus on that term inclusivity or being inclusive in science communication. Yeah, and this is, I mean, and this comes from Sid Harth. This is not, you know, I was the wrangler on this course and he did a lot of that writing, so he should comment after me. But I think um, from the larger perspective in creating these psychology courses, um, right, I think it, inclusion can come, you know, we think about it often in a big view of like trying to include, you know, everyone, but like really when you do that, sometimes you're not doing really including anyone really at all like trying to include everyone sometimes is totally against the point and so in this course in particular and I know in, in creating you know in communicating about it Siddharth has done a really good job of like trying to push towards inclusion of like what have we not heard right so it's like what stories are unfamiliar so we even ran a science communication challenge after the course to kind of invite people and we'd love people in the chat to do the same of like share your own like examples from your country or culture or just your personal experience of how science communication has touched you or um knowledge sharing like in your own culture or history because finding those lesser known examples is how we're going to, you know, help diversify the history of science communication. And maybe they're not written down or there's nowhere for us to find them without chatting and talking with each other. So um, for me personally, when it comes to like project courses, when I talk about the diversity angle and the inclusion, it's like bringing diverse individuals and creators to the table in order to, to have any hope of making these courses and these histories more inclusive. Um, maybe that's just, uh, I don't know how else to go about it other than bringing individuals like Siddharth to the table because I certainly can't do that myself. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yes, please Siddharth. Yeah, just to quickly add to what Paige said, and, and this is the reason I said that our lifeology course was just the beginning is because inclusion does not always imply that you are respecting and understanding indigenous context that just, I mean, to not to, not to disrespect what Faith said, but getting people on the table is just the first step. You really need to sort of work towards, you know, making sure that they actually have a voice and they're being heard and they actually have a stake and the agency to affect things. Um, so I would say inclusion does not always imply reconciliation of indigenous people and their histories and their context. Uh, that requires a lot of active work. And, and that is why our course is literally scratching the surface. And it's just the first step. There's so much more to be done. So yeah. I think um, indeed, thank you for everyone sharing wonderful ideas in the chat and links to work by other scholars. And I'm very happy to see as well the link, Bruce, that you've posted to Cebu C. Subayela's article on decolonializing science and, and you know, how difficult it can be. And I think the, the, the fact that this is a hot topic is also reflected by many of the examples that, that some of you are sharing um, in the chat. And I think that's very valuable. So I want to ask um, maybe a difficult question to you, Bruce, and, and if anybody else wants to comment as well, you're more than welcome. So, you know, I, I, we, we think a lot about history of science as such, and now we're also talking about the history of science communication. The book that you refer to, that uh, Tosk Asquin sort of managed the process, the, the, is looking at how science communication evolved in, in many countries around the world. So my question is, is two things. So the first is, do you think it would be valuable, useful, or relevant to indeed develop? And it will be a process, and it will be a dynamic process that will always be able to add, be added to, but maybe develop a, a curriculum that can be taught um, at, at university level about the history of science communication, so as opposed to the history of science. And then the second question, sort of part of that is, you know, if, if yes or no, whatever you feel, but would it be useful? I mean, would it would it help um, science students to think and reflect on on, on science and society? Um, thanks, Rena. It's a, it's a really challenging question, and I think uh, part of the, I think yes, I always think that more courses are better. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think, uh, yes, a, 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 a richer, fuller course on the history of science communication would be important. But there's a danger, which is that as we narrow our understanding, in order to do a course on science communication, we would be defining science communication as its own thing and losing some of the connections to the broader history of science or history or culture and so on. And so there's a, this is a, it, it's, it's like the classic biological problem of are we talking about lumpers or splitters, right? So as we define science communication more narrowly, we lose our understanding of the broader context that it's in. So uh, there's a question in the chat, um, uh, how, do, how do we, the panelists, define science communication? And I think, Part of what's happened is that in the community that we are, those of us on this panel are part of, most of us are practitioners in the current time. So we define science communication as that mix of things between science journalism and science museums and community actions and public information officers and scientists who like to go out and communicate. That is one way of defining what science communication is. It has a particular history of how they come together. But the point of the course that Siddharth and Arga produced with, with Paige's um, organization and collaborate, I think Wrangler was the term Paige used, um, was um, is that science communication is much more than that thing that, that our students who come to us today to learn how to be science communicators um, see it as it's this much broader thing that has to be seen in a historical context in a cultural context and when you do that you then have to understand how what that does is it leads you to a much broader understanding of what science is uh, and what what the search for reliable knowledge is and what counts as reliable knowledge and the role of institutions and messy processes and so forth so i think there is tremendous value in helping our current students understand that messiness. But we also have to understand that when we do that, we're actually taking them quite a ways away from what it is they are hoping to do in the moment. Um, right. And not everybody is uh, uh -huh. open to having their mind exploded in that way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I want to touch on an, on another topic that also comes from the questions and, 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 and something that you also said, Bruce, you mentioned that even your graduate students enjoyed having access to visuals and short, concise summaries. And um, AP asked something about credibility of, of what we teach and, and what we communicate. So sometimes there's this notion, and forgive me if you don't agree, but I've certainly come across it that, you know, when you have a comic or a cartoon or even a lifeology flashcard course, it is somehow less um, important because it's visual and it's illustrated and it's short. You know, it's not an academic text. It's not, it's not, doesn't have a lot of jargon in it. It doesn't sound very scholarly. And so my question then is, and maybe Arga, if you want to comment on this or anybody else really, um, how do we somehow get over that uh, barrier and, and show that, that visuals and visual communication can be as credible and as valuable and relevant as, as you know, slabs of copy, to put it that way. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, I do think that visual narrative or visually visual explanation is, of course, very much important. Like, uh, even there, it's not new. Though, right? uh, mm -hmm. Also, there are many curriculum even in many universities. Mm -hmm. Not the full uh, full stretched curriculum, but there are sister curriculums like uh, people are using visuals, uh, photographs. Uh, in, okay, so uh, visual means not only illustration, but it's also a very diverse field. Like even cinema, making documentary, uh, even uh, making tapestry um, or the motifs. Uh, uh, on buildings, uh, even everything could be visuals. And people have used uh, this kind of visual motifs uh, uh, since a long time. It's not new. But now as a science communicator, or since we are entering a new era of science communication or history of science communication, we are redefining this. We need to archive these things and to bring out new meaning from this. and need to uh, write down these things and publish 
just like lifeology course and we need to recreate this kind of thing yeah visual media is very important and we have to uh, i would say rethink in this way even even it could uh, ease the language barrier also so mm. yeah so that make any sense uh, what i answered to you yeah okay. I think some of the trends that we see, even in scholarly publishing, where they're increasingly asking mm -hmm. for visual abstracts or visual summaries, it can also maybe yeah, 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 begin yeah. to build appreciation for this kind of communication. Um, I don't know if anybody else yeah, has yeah, experienced yeah, yeah. any pushback here yeah, about visuals or people kind of thinking it's not, yeah. Yeah, I think, and going, kind of trying to weave the discussions we've been having that Bruce mentioned, I think, even just myself, like if you ask me what science communication was when I first graduated from my PhD in science communication, I would probably have, you know, given you a discrete answer. And like as I'm going, I'm less and less sure of exactly what it is. Like if you ask me today to define it, I might actually have a more difficult time defining it because myself, you know, increasingly thinking about, you know, broadening that sense of what is science communication right I think a lot of us think about it as communicating technical knowledge you know like explaining something I mean that's only a tiny piece of what science communication can be and I think but I think it's something that in the science world that's very important right it's like you need to explain the technical bits like you know explain what's going on and then some of the lifeology courses that we're creating it might the whole goal might be just having people be less scared or intimidated of a health topic so that they can ask their doctor questions about it. And so if, if the lifeology course has that goal, it might, it might not get across a lot of technical or new information and still be very successful or do what it was supposed to do by bringing in visuals and being very embracing and getting people to feel like they can, they can, this topic belongs to them, this aspect of science mm -hmm. belongs to them, they could comment on it. Um, so I think there's a lot that, th that these mm -hmm. visual stories can do that's beyond just explaining science, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I, I think it was in one of Emily Dawson's papers where she's talked about when you walk into an institution like a museum or a science center, ideally you should feel at home if you want it to be inclusive. And I think the same is true for the visuals. If you kind of see yourself and see your own, you know, experiences and, and countries and whatever reflected there, you feel at home and you feel that connection. And, um, and they can certainly break down some of the barriers that we worry about in, in, in science communication. So um, I, I love the comment by Alida van Dijk, uh, who said, you know, we should revisit the ways in which we define scholar or scholarly thinking and writing. I think science communication as a field of practice and, and the research insights from this field also makes us think about, for example, I read a paper the other day about jargon, you know, increasing problem, the, the, how jargon um, really excludes people, but not only uh, lay people, it also excludes scientists from each other's writing because, you know, even scientists are battling to keep up with their colleagues' jargon in, in related fields. So I think there's, a, a, there's an interesting trend towards making things more accessible, more understandable, and including more visual. And I think if I have to summarize what we talked about today, it would be, you know, we really have to change the narrative of science and science communication. And that includes the visuals, you know, the, the visual images that we use and that we share, that we use to illustrate our stories. And then I, and I like, really like Andrew's comment about, you know, helping people to build um, lifelong relationships with science. So it doesn't become something foreign. It becomes something that all of us can share and enjoy. Um, yeah. And, and, and your response as well, Bruce, about, you know, thinking about science communication, who's involved in it, who is it for, who plays a role. So I think that this sort of neatly summarizes everything we've, we've talked about. So with that, before I conclude, um, I want to just give the panel the opportunity for any, if you have any final thought, comment that you want to make. Uh, I, I had a quick comment. So uh, going off from what Arja and Paige mentioned about visuals, I just wanted to re-emphasize that science is, is a particular way of knowing which has its own set of norms and values and ethics, but it's not the only form of knowing, right? And it's imperceptible to a lot of other forms of knowledge, which is 
around us in the world right which includes visuals which includes oral storytelling practices and i think this journey from moving towards science to uh, acknowledging these different forms of knowing is where the gold of science communication lies and and that's where we need to sort of uh, sort of situate ourselves to be able to understand how much broader we need to think in terms of doing science communication effectively so i'll just like to say that. thank you Well, wow, I think you've, uh, that's a wonderful way to, to wrap up this webinar. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for participating. Please um, enjoy your exploration on the Lifeology Flashcard course uh, website. There's some wonderful topics to uh, explore there. And uh, thank you also very much to Jenny Metcalf and Anna Claudia Nepoti for hosting and all the technical support behind the scenes. Um, I couldn't have done it without you and without all of you. And I really appreciate the um, fact that so many of you joined and and got up early, very early, or stayed up late. Um, I love that final comment also from Alida, science is a story of stories. What a wonderful way to end this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.